Do you know the 14 traits of successful chiropractors? We've interviewed some of the top chiropractors in the industry and have identified the common traits that they all share. Jump on over to www.chirobusinessmojo.com to get your free report today. Welcome to the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast, where we deconstruct the methods, marketing, and mindset of successful business people and chiropractors from around the world. And now your host, Dr. Richard Day. Hello, hello, I am Dr. Richard Day, and this is the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast. Well, hello there, and thank you once again for checking in with me and spending a little bit of your valuable time with me here today. Well, I am very excited because I've got someone on the show who is not a chiropractor. He is someone who goes and speaks all across America and the world, in fact, and inspires people and teaches them how to talk to people. This is such a valuable skill for us chiropractors. It's what we do all day. Yes, we treat. Yes, we adjust. But it is our communication skills that really drives it home. It's how we tell people we communicate the value of what it is that we do and what we do so well, why it's so important to them and to their lives. So if you talk to a patient, if you talk in public, if you speak in any way to people, this is something, a skill you need to improve. And one of the things that's great about our guest is he is really good at helping to convert people from, you know, people who have come to listen to you when you talk and coming up and saying, hey, that was a really good speech you gave. I really enjoyed that, to saying, I want to come into your practice. I want your care. Roberto Monaco is the co-founder of Influenceology LLC. He's been a full-time speaker, coach, and trainer since 2002 and has conducted more than 2,700 presentations for corporate America and over 100 presentations in Brazil. He worked for the Anthony Robbins companies for six years. Yes, Tony Robbins. Maybe you've heard of him. And from 2004 to 2007, he was the top producer and revenue generator in the country. From 2005 to 2008, Roberto also coached and trained all the other peak performance strategists at the Anthony Robbins companies. He has advised and consulted with Fortune 500 companies, executives, managers, and sales professionals in the areas of peak performance, leadership, psychology of achievement, and presentation skills and sales. Roberto conducts training sessions for distinguished audiences including Toyota, Ford, Remax, Coldwell Banker, Prudential, Century 21, Citibank, Marriott, American Express Financial, Bank of America, Washington Mutual, Wells Fargo, and Chambers of Commerce all over the United States. In addition to conducting workshops and presentations, Roberto spends on average 15 hours a week conducting one-on-one coaching sessions with CEOs, managers, professional salespeople, and entrepreneurs from a wide range of industries, including mortgage, real estate, financial planning, coaching, retail training and development, etc. Roberto Monaco is originally from Porto Alegre, Brazil, and he conducts workshops and trainings in three languages, English, Portuguese, and Spanish. He lives in San Diego, California, and welcome, Roberto Monaco. Welcome. I am super excited to be here. Ready to do this. Well, we are so excited to have you, and I want you to jump in and fill in any gaps that I might have missed when I was giving your bio. Well, I don't. Th- I think you cover did a, a really good job. The only thing that I want to add today is that chiropractic has changed my life and has changed the life of my wife. And I am super honored to be speaking to your podcast today, to your listeners. And more than anything, I feel like it's my obligation to serve the chiropractic industry. So, Wow. I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, that is the focus of this show, as you know. So uh, we talk about a lot of general things, but it's always nice if, if you – you know, a guest is who is not a chiropractor has at least experienced it and uh, and knows what we're all about. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, I have been under chiropractic care for almost four years now with a doctor Ryan Hummel here in in San Diego. And how I started with chiropractic, uh, chiropractic uh, I've been doing public speaking, presentation, coaching since two thousand two. And one of my coaching clients four years ago, Gary Gunderson, referred me to a guy named Dr. Crisano. And four years ago, if you were to ask me what is chiropractic, probably I'll not be able to tell you <laughs> four years ago. And and I, I would start coaching Chris, Dr. Chris, like I coach anybody else, like a financial planner, lawyer. Basically, he had this uh, dinner with a doctor program that he was doing at that time, and he was 
closing around 50%. And after a couple coaching calls, I never forget this. He did a dinner. There's 80 prospective patients. He closed 78 appointments. He calls me freaking out. And then uh, he even recorded a video, put on YouTube as a testimonial. And then we develop a relationship. And obviously, I start working on his uh, doctor's reports. And eventually, uh, Dr. Chris one day called me up and said, hey, man. How many times do we have to watch my DR until you go and see a chiropractor? You know, and then the next day I was, uh, I was seeing, working with Dr. Ryan Hummel. And just a quick story here. My, at the time, my, my wife, she had stopped taking birth control pills and her period never came back, never came back. And we started the care. And when you do, when you did the x-rays, day one, we found out that she had big, two big subluxations, one in the neck and one in the lower back, and we started care. And last year, Dr. Richard, December 24th, uh, I'm drinking coffee with my mom and her mom in San Francisco, like 9 o'clock in the morning. My wife comes running out of the bathroom, bawling, crying, and, and I told her, what happened? What happened? What happened? She goes, she couldn't talk. She was bawling, crying, and I said, what happened? She goes, you won't believe it, but I just got my period and three, three and a half years into care. So moments later, I made a decision that I was going to use all my skills, all my knowledge about public speaking, presentation skills. I've done 4,000 talks, 11,000 hours of public speaking coaching. I was going to use everything I know to help chiropractors so that the chiropractor, the doctor, becomes the number one source for health and wellness care in their community. Not the do- not traditional MDs, but the chiropractor. So that's why I'm talking to you today here. Wow, what a powerful story! And thanks so much for sharing, you know, that with us. Because, you know, all without drugs or surgery—that's the beauty of it. And uh, mm-hmm. that's why we're doing this show. We want more of us to be able to be successful, so that yep. more of the public can get some of the great stuff that we're doing. Yep, 100%. Well, let's dive right into, you know, how important communication is. I've had a lot of people on the show, doctors and experts who have been in the business for a long time and people that have had a lot of success. And I can tell you, almost unanimously, they rate being effective, at, you know, at communication as among the top skills that we really need to perfect. So what are people doing wrong when it comes to being effective in their communication? Well, I'm going to speak to chiropractors today because my heart goes to them. You see, chiropractic has been around for 121 years, and according to Chiroconomics, I, I read an article, 14% of Americans are under chiropractic care, which means that for us to get the other 86%, because I believe everybody deserves and must be under chiropractic care, would take us 743 years. Think about that. Now, so the number one thing they're not doing, they're not advocating the chiropractic message, you know? I, and I, and I, and I see a lot of doctors and I say, look, how many times are speaking a week? How many videos are recording? Right? How many outside talks are doing a week? And the majority of them, not all, because there's a lot of uh, doctors who are advocating, but a lot of guys and girls, doctors, and, uh, they don't advocate. So the number one mistake is not consistently getting the message out. And I, and I hear the question that I pose to the listeners. If you were to have a coffee with a BJ Palmer now and BJ would sit down and talk to you and say, hey, how many talks are we doing a week to communicate the chiropractic message? How many videos are recording a week to talk about chiropractic? Right? What would you tell BJ? Would BJ be uh, proud of your efforts or not? So the number one mistake is not speaking at all. And, and after being around chiropractic industry for four years, I see a lot of that, Dr. Richard, a lot, number one. And the number two is this, chiropractic has a foundation of, it has a great philosophy of chiropractic, the power who creates the body, heals the body. You have the science of chiropractic. I'm working with Dr. Dan Sullivan now, uh, which is an amazing guy, and during my my process of working with him, I learned that chiropractic is not about the back, it's about the brain. You have all the scientific evidence to prove that, and then you have the art of chiropractic. You see, every chiropractor is different and every adjustment feels differently. Now, here's the mistake. Most doctors, they don't know or understand that communication also has a philosophy, also has a science, and also has an art. So after you are good at being a doctor of chiropractic and be able to provide amazing care, I believe that you have to make a commitment to master the philosophy, the science, and the art of communication. 
Well, it's no secret that I think a lot of things, uh, one of the things that is holding people back from doing more public speaking is a fear of public speaking. You know, that yes. consistently ranks very high on, on people's... A hundred percent. Yeah. And so uh, what can people do to overcome that and really get some confidence in speaking? Well, the number thing, the number one thing is to realize that you are not alone. Is because around 75% of Americans experience some type of speaking anxiety. So number one thing, realize not alone. And number two, don't personalize because a lot of times people think like, oh man, I have this fear, this energy, and so and so doesn't have it. That speaker, he or she is awesome. He or she doesn't have it. The truth is that most of us speakers, I mean, I personally done over 4,000 talks with a thick accent from Brazil, and I, I keep pushing through it. And we all at some level experience this energy, but I don't personalize. There's nothing wrong with me. I think the number one strategy that I can share with you, with our listeners today to help them is this. In group communication speaking, it is all about moving the audience from point A to point B. Point, for example, this podcast, point A, you have awareness when it comes to your group communication or, or public speaking efforts. I hope that the point B, the end of this podcast, you learn new ideas that you can use today so you can make this this class, this uh, audio, this podcast super valuable. That's the idea. Every communication is always about moving someone from point A to point B. Now, the reason people experience this fear Imagine right now, I want you guys to imagine you have a, a spotlight in your face. This is a strong light, okay? And this light equals your focus. And what happens is that as long as you have the focus in yourself, that means this light in your face almost like blinds you, then you're going to experience this fear, this uncertainty, this doubt, this anxiety. Because your conversation in your head is, how do I look? How do I sound? Am I being judged right now? Do they like my accent? Do, do, we, do, we, do they think I'm smart enough? And the moment you change or switch the spotlight and you put it on the audience, you realize, because now the light's on them, you're going to realize that the energy, the fear, the anxiety goes away. Because the truth is, every communication that you do is always about moving people from point A to point B. Now, I understand as a speaker, you are leading the group, but ultimately you're just leading them. It's about them moving from point A to point B. And every talk that you give is never about you as a speaker. It's a hundred percent always about the audience. This podcast, yes, I'm talking here. Dr. Richards interviewing me, but ultimately it's about the listener where you are right now and where you're going to be in 40 minutes, whatever, right? With the, with the new skills. So this whole podcast is about you. So that's why when I speak nowadays and our clients that you help, they don't have this crazy fear because they realize that they are not, uh, they're not focusing themselves. And another mistake too, I just want to point out that people do, and I noticed there's other speaking uh, and coaching uh, programs out there that they, they say, hey, a public speaking engagement should be a performance. And I believe that that belief just causes extra anxiety. Because you're not perfor- you're not Beyonce on stage. You know what I mean, <laughs> you're not going. To, you're you're not. You're just a human communicating to groups of people, and it's okay to make mistakes. And sometimes you have this idea or this huge performance, and beca- and then if you say one word wrong or if you make a big mistake, now you 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 feel bad. And I don't believe that speaking about performance. I believe that is ultimately it's about communication, and you want to be a hundred percent yourself and genuine. And if you have a mistake, you own it and you keep going. So to sum up, always focus on your audience 100%. And when you do that, do we want to – I mean obviously we want to gear our topic to in, what interests our audience. Do we want yep. to be interactive with our audience? Do we want to call on people? 100%. So here's the idea. The psychology of, uh, of interaction has changed. Ten years ago, we didn't have Facebook, YouTube, texting – LinkedIn, Pinterest, whatever. We didn't have it. So we are not on our phones uh, before. So what happens 10 or 15 years ago, the public speaking model, if you look at it, was one person in front of the room communicating and speaking to the audience, and the audience didn't have this urge, desire to engage. Now, because you're so conditioned to the texting, the likes, the shares, the comments, 
we are we are so engaged and so uh, conditioned to be communicating, exchange, and participating in the conversation back and forth. So the the audience requires nowadays that you engage them, and engaging the audience is probably one of the easiest things to do, and one of the most effective things you can do to incl- increase your closing ratios. Well, that helps because, you know, uh, I think people themselves get a little bit of stage fright when you call on them. But once you get their involvement in, I think they do start really keying in more to what you're saying. And if one person does it and they see that, maybe someone else will and someone else will after that. Well, we know another thing, too, Dr. Richard, and I teach uh, this uh, principle in our classes. She who sets the frame wins the game, right? Or he who sets the frame wins the game. So one of the things that you want to do in your in your talks is to preframe the need for participation before you actually start going in and deliver your content. And you make the need for the audience, not for you as the speaker, for the audience. That way, the audience will engage with you, participate, because they know they're going to learn more. And that is a... Out of 100 speakers that I coach, 99 don't do that. Then, obviously, I start helping them. But you want to set up the need for participating in your talk before you actually go into your content. Great. And that's a, that's a huge distinction. Yeah, huge yeah. Distinction. What a way to write, you know, from the get-go, establish the, the rules of the game. Mm-hmm. 100%. I want to check with you on something that I noticed when I was watching some of the materials uh, uh, and the videos on your site. You talk about body language and you, you yep. how that affects uh, the presentation. Can you expand on that a little bit, the do's and Yeah, things? just a little bit. Body language is always better to show through video. But, here, but in a nutshell, okay, certainty does not sway. Certainty doesn't sway. So as a communicator – Sometimes you, you prepare your message. Sometimes you rehearse your message. And I, but I see speakers all the time. Either A, they're pacing like a tiger because they have this all this nervous energy. Or sometimes they're swaying back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And unconsciously, they're, even though the words they're saying could be really powerful, the body language communicating this message or of uncertainty. So one of the things that you can do is to make sure you center yourself and you don't pace like a tiger and you don't go back and forth. You, you don't rock back and forth or sway in one leg or another back and forth. There's something called the speaker's stand when your, your, your arms and your shoulders and your hands are parallel to your foot and, and you, you, you focus in your core and you're like, you're really centered. And you start speaking from that angle. Now, obviously, you want to be able to walk and be animated, especially when you tell a story and engage in the audience. You don't want to be you know, just like planted there the whole time. But also, you don't want to be pacing like a tiger back and forth. So it is this idea that certainly doesn't sway and, and, you, and you adopt a speaker's stance at the beginning and then you can walk and move and, and do things like that. So. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, as you're speaking, I'm thinking of, you know, I've watched a lot of TED Talks and I mm-hmm. study what those people do. They give such yeah. engaging uh, talks that are riveting a lot of times, but they aren't pacing around. Yeah. And uh, and so as you're speaking, I, that it, that that resonates because uh, that's what I try to do when I speak. And, uh, and I can see why that's a little, you know, disconcerting if the speaker's doing that. Well, let me talk to you about this. Uh, you mentioned... Um, in your materials, that storytelling is really where it's at in terms of yep. conveying a message. Can you expand yep. on that a little? Okay. Storytelling storytelling is the tool of influence. I'm telling you because it's how we communicate it. Stories becomes, it comes before language. Right? There's a psychologist, uh, Jerome Brunner, that talks about that stories – they come before language. So even before you learn how to speak, you have this story that you want to communicate. What happens, by the way, I can go on and on and on in storytelling here, but here's, I want to give you why you should tell a story. Because every time you, you tell your audience a fact or you have an argument, the audience can counter argue the point, the position, the fact. Now, when you tell a story, it's harder because 
they cannot counter argue your story or your personal experience. Right? So that's why when you want to communicate a really powerful point, I usually like to wrap up with a story around it because it's really hard to counter argue story. Why? Because it is my what? My personal experience. And, and, and there's three different stories that I believe every speaker must be able to tell, which is super. And if you know these three stories, you're good to go. Okay. Number one, your personal story. Your personal story is why you are there speaking. Why you are there, uh, delivering that message. The second story I call the Swiss Army Knife story. That's the story to illustrate any point, any point. Uh, and I just, I just had an event, uh, last weekend and I told this story that the mom zebra just had a baby and the babe the zebra was just born in the wild, right? And the mom zebra after one minute, like that the babe was born, was telling the baby, come on, you have to learn how to run right now. And the, the baby zebra, mom, I was just born a minute ago. Let me smell the, the grass. And the mom zebra, come on. You have to learn how to run right now. Like, mom, hold on. Let me watch the blue skies. And the mom like, no, 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 you don't understand. Come on. You have to learn how to run right now. And the baby zebra said, why, mom? She said, because the lions are coming. And if you don't learn how to run right now, the lions are going to eat you alive. Now, I know you're thinking, Roberto, that's a cute story, but in my town, I don't have lions running around the streets, right? And I'm thinking, well, of course not. You have different kinds of lions. The lions of subluxation, the lions of cancer, the lions of heart disease, the lions of untapped potential, the lions of unrealized dreams, and the lions of unfulfilled purpose. Don't allow those lions eat your dreams. Start running, my friends. Right? So basically, that's the story about urgency. Right? So you can use that story if you're doing a health talk, you can use that story. So that's the second kind of story. So you have your personal story. You have the Swiss armor knife stories that you can use for everything. And then you have your patient stories. And if you master these stories, you're going to do super well in speaking communication. By the way, storytelling is not public speaking tool. You can use storytelling through video, through one-on-one communication, through webinars or podcasts like I'm doing right now. Well, we'll talk about the video aspect of it, of it in just a bit. I do want to talk about this next thing. We've covered communication in general and just overcoming public speaking and getting better. But, you know, a lot of us chiropractors have gotten in front of a crowd, and we've given yep. a health talk. Yep. And people come up to us after and say, hey, great talk, and shake our hands, and then nothing happens. And you mentioned Dr. Zeno, and his, yep. you, know, you worked with him, and suddenly something changed. So how do we go from being good public speakers to persuaders? Okay. This is like um, a loaded question. I do a class in 30 hours that I focus on that. So I'm going to give, try to give as much right now because I don't want to, I want to make sure you guys know there's a lot behind it. Uh, I would say that I like, I, when I see someone speaking, I see the presenter, I see the presentation and the performance. So the presenter, because a lot of times, have you, I don't know if you noticed, know but in, in a coaching group, or practice management group. You can give the same presentation, the same script to 10 doctors. You're going to have 10 different results. Why is that? Is the presentation the presenter? So the presenter have to have this sense of certainty, of love, the empathy, unstoppable mindset. Because for him or her, if your mindset is and your, and your psychology is not super powerful, it won't work, Right? There's, it's not about the speaking skill. You see, I can give a, another story. I used to work for Tony Robbins before. I used to train speakers. And at one time we hired this guy. He used to be a theology teacher. Amazing speaker. I'm talking about amazing. And you send him to his, to the field. And at that time he was, uh, responsible for selling, uh, Tony Robbins tickets. So basically he was doing the stocks and in the end of it he was selling a four day event and he couldn't close. Now, here's the, the, the challenge. He was running the same presentation that other guys who couldn't speak as well, and they're selling more. And, and, and then one time I flew to New York to coach him, and I, had, I saw his, his uh, presentation. Then after, I said, come on, I already know the, what's going on. Let's get a coffee. And I just asked this question. What do you believe about promoting our services in, from 
the front of the room. And he said, you know, Roberto, I feel like a used car sales guy. You see, he had the, the, the public speaking skills. He had the script. But he had this limitation, this limited belief in his head that stopped him from being effective. So that's why the presenter comes first, always, always, always. The second part is the presentation. And the presentation in Florence way, which when I, I teach your classes, I go over 10 hours in the whole science of it. But basically have five areas, your opening, pre-frame, body, pre-close and close. Opening, how you open up your talk, you engage the audience, pre-frame. Is how you position yourself, your content, and the rules of engagement. Then you have the body, uh, and you, where is seventy percent of your content, your, your points, your stories, your evidence. Then you have your pre-close when it comes to your offer, which most Kairos do a really poor, a poor job. Then you have your close. So in any of these five areas, we can spend talking about one hour on them. But but quickly, I can tell you that I see this pattern. When it comes to the presentation, most Kairos, okay, most, I'm talking about 99% of them. The, I promise, the last talk that I gave, they spend a lot of time on the opening, the pre-frame, the body, and almost, almost no time rehearsing the close and the pre-close. I promise. Why? Because they feel super uncomfortable. So if you want to get one thing away from this podcast, that actually you can make money and change your life this Next time you speak and present, I want to make sure you rehearse your pre-close and close at least seven times. And the reason people are so uncomfortable, number one, is because they're they're speaking, right? They're, they're having this great time speaking, and they're about to close. They're thinking, hey, here comes the close. The audience is going to start judging me right now. And then when they actually go into the close, because they haven't rehearsed the close, they feel uncomfortable. The audience feels uncomfortable, and now they rush to the close. So one thing that you can do to change the pattern immediately today is to rehearse your talk, your close seven times at least. So now when you actually go into your close, you feel super comfortable, you've done it, you own it, and you're excited about it. All right? And the third thing is the performance. And the, let's say you have a, a doctor who's the presenter, right? Super confident. You have the presentation. Someone has amazing talk. The performance is how you actually deliver the talk. Well, um, a lot of people may have subluxation and delivery, poor eye contact, poor energy, feel awards. He or she doesn't know what, how to control the audience or how to engage the audience. So there's a lot of things that your message subluxated the delivery, then you won't maximize the impact. So you want to make sure, number one, you're, as a presenter, you are in the most powerful state ever. Number two, that you have a persuasive talk, the presentation, a great opening, great pre-frame, the body, the stories, the pre-close and close. And then the delivery, the performance of your talk, the delivery has passion, influence, and charisma. Well, I know that this takes a lot of hours of training as you talked about, but let's talk specifically about the close and why okay. it's so important. Perfect. Let's talk about it. I got a couple questions around it. I'm going to narrow it down just to two. Yeah. How long does a good close take? And okay. And what are some of the key points that have to be addressed? Okay. Your, the close depends on what you're promoting or selling. So let's say if you're doing a chiropractic talk, let's say, a dinner with a doctor, let's say. Let's say the dinner is 30 minutes. I would say now the close would be around seven, around seven minutes. Let me tell you why. Because you're going to close for appointments. You're going to close for referrals. You're going to close for speaking gigs. So I have doctors who not only close over 100% of the room of uh, prospective patients, but also walk away with 30, 40, 50 patient referrals for the next dinner and walk away with 10, 15 speaking gigs. So in order for you to do that, you got to spend some time. Now, if you're close, now, some people say, Roberto, I don't care about referrals or speaking gigs. Then your close might be two, three minutes. It would be super simple. All right, number one. So it depends on, on your offer. What's, what was the second question again? Uh, what are some of the key points that okay. you want to address in the close? Okay, perfect. Number one, um, number one, you want to talk about the offer. All right? And here's something that I notice. Most of chiropractors, they go, so come to, to my clinic to get checked. And what happens is if, 
you want to make sure you build up value in your appointment. So how do you do that, Roberto? You do you build up value in your appointment by doing two things. Number one, develop a name for your offer. And I'm telling you here, Dr. Richard, I don't have a handle car, a handle don't have a, I ask this, they don't have a name for. It. You could I call wellness breakthrough examination. Right? You make your offer more formal. Number two, you list everything that's gonna happen in your offer. For example, I'm gonna do a history exam. I'm gonna do x rays. I'm gonna do posture analysis. You list everything. And then the second thing you're gonna do you're going to transform, you're going to use benefit language, okay? And then you're going to uh, transform those features into benefit for the audience. For example, you're going to say something like, the first thing that you're going to do in a wellness breakthrough examination, you're going to do a history exam, which means to you, you see, which means to you, then you talk about the benefit, right? Benefit language are things like, which means to you, which really means to you. So that, so you finally understand, so you'll be able to see, right? So you can say something like, the first thing you want to do, we want to do a, a history exam, which means to you, blank. We also going to do x-ray, so you'll be able to see, right? and you keep talking, the benefit. We also going to do a posture exam, so that you finally understand, see, you, 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 you build up this huge value in the audience's mind. And the last, uh, and so that's, that's something that I do. I have, and then another element of the, the offer, I call the three Fs. This is more advanced, but I want to give you here the three Fs. Number one, freedom of choice. Number two, future regret. Number three, future pacing. So the first F, freedom of choice. Second, future regret. Third one, future pacing. So I use that. I can say something like, look, obviously, when it comes to your health, you have the power to do whatever you want to do. That's called freedom of choice. Why? Because influence research shows that when you acknowledge that the audience has the power to decide, reduce resistance. And and the, because sometimes some people, some doctors are so passionate about their message, about Cairo, they'll be like, and that's the only way you're going to be healthy. Why? And I understand that's the only way. But guess what? The audience, they can choose not do anything about it. Right? right. So so you want to acknowledge that. Say, look, when it comes to health and wellness, obviously you have the power to decide what you're going to do. But that's the first F. Then I say something like future regret. The future regret you have to say with almost like you go in your heart and you, you're, you have to be 100% uh, genuine, genuine and come from a place of love, you can say something like, I just want you to consider for a second. Let's say six months from now, you haven't done anything to remove your subluxations or your or interference in the spine. Let's say something, your, your condition that you have right now that gets worse. Right? Here's the question. Wouldn't you regret when you look back to this moment and you know you could have done something about it but you didn't? Wouldn't you regret Right? Because reg- nobody wants to regret, right? And regret's a powerful emotion. So usually you're gonna get this, this internal little yes, like, and then, but you don't wanna end up there. So that's, you're gonna use the third F, which is future pacing. You're gonna pace them to the future. You're gonna say, now imagine on the other hand, you invest in your health, your most important asset you have. How does it feel six months from now that you doing everything you can to maximize your health. What kind of peace of mind are you gonna have six months from now when you and your family are protected because you guys are taking action every single day? Why? Right? What kind of things you're gonna be able to do six months from now that you can right now because you took action today? So basically you get them fired up and then you can say that's why today I encourage you guys to do an appointment. Right? Now I when it comes to giving discounts or not, I'm not qualified to do that. That would be my buddy, John Davila, which is, uh, I coach him and he's a great guy. He's a compliance uh, guy. But something that I, I, I develop, I'm super proud. I have like hundreds of doctors using this. Um, I, I just use one question. When I build up my offer, remember when I said you have the wellness breakthrough 
evaluation. The first thing that you're going to do is the history exam, which means to you, blah, blah, blah. We're also going to do x-rays, which means to you, blah, blah, blah. We're also going to do a posture, posture assessment so that you finally understand, blah, blah, blah. And then I pause and say something like this. This, this question has, is, is helping doctors close rooms. After you go through this, you say something like this. I'm curious. If you were to get all these exams in a hospital, if they were to be available, which they are not, how much do you think it would cost you? And I have this in tape. More than 30 different doctors sending their videos, right? I've seen this. They go 5,000, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000. And then you create this crazy contrast. So that's the way you get around it. And you say, good, you're right. You know, but because you have a family practice, when you, when you invest yourself today, it's only blank. So you don't have to be offering discounts. Why? Because you use this contrast question. And then, so we talk about the offer. You, 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 you describe the features of the offer, what the offer would do for them. You, you can use a contrast question, which I just gave. You use the three Fs, the freedom of choice, future regret, future pacing, and then you can go into the why they got to take action now, right? Why today? Why that? And then you want to give a, you can give a logical reason, you can give an emotional reason. I like to talk about the Lodai, which is the law of diminishing intention, even the highest intentions decrease over time. Lodai, L-O-D-Y, L-O-D-Y, law of diminishing intention, even the highest in, even the highest intention decrease over time. So I say, how many of you at one point in your life, you promise yourself, hey, I'm going to start working out on Monday. Then comes Monday to say, well, maybe next Monday, right? Because your intention decreases. So I talk about that. And then I usually I recommend my clients to have a form and you guide them through the form and then to, to register. And then I have a closing story to bring the emotional, uh, the emotional close. So that's pretty much, there's more strategy, but you can give an idea or how deep we go through clothes. Yeah, I'll say. I mean, there is so much value in what you just laid out there. It, it's incredible. Oh. I, I, wow. <laughs> I, I took some notes while you were talking. And, uh, you know, it's it's amazing. We're all um, emotional creatures. And, I, yep. and some of us maybe sit down and create a spreadsheet before we make a decision to, to make a purchase or go forward with a big change in our in our lives. But a lot more of us really respond to something emotional. And to be able to understand how that works um, mm-hmm. you know, we, we have such a great service. Uh, we'd like to think it sells itself, but really you have to help lead a person to their own conclusion, and you've really laid out a powerful way to make that happen. Wow, that's a lot of great information. He has dropped some intense value bombs. Make sure you check out part two of the interview with Roberto Monaco. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening, listening to the Cairo Business, Business Mojo, Mojo podcast, podcast at, at www.cairobusinessmojo.com. Www.cairobusinessmojo.com.